Stop. Allumage moteur Vulcan. Allumage confirme. Allo. Du giovane. Salut, servus. Allo. Giro. Pronto. Dove ero? Tenso. Sì. Allo. Hola. Gudo. Ciao a tutti. Buongiorno. Allo. 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 Hello and welcome. My name is Melissa Alexander and I'm coming to you from the Exploratorium in San Francisco. We've been learning a little bit today here about the Rosetta mission, which is a mission of the European Space Agency to rendezvous a spacecraft, rendezvous a, uh, take a spacecraft and have it rendezvous with a comet. And it turns out that that spacecraft has a really interesting connection to a project here in San Francisco. And so I thought we'd invite Dr. Laura Welcher to talk to us a little bit about what that project is. Can you tell us about this? Sure. Uh, so I direct a project at the Long Now Foundation called the Rosetta Project. And uh, we're building an archive of all of the world's languages. And there's about 7,000 languages in the world, so this is a big job. And we're also building a very long-term backup of our archive, which is in the form of this Rosetta disk. And this is a disk of information on over about a thousand languages that contains information from our collection. And the idea is that um, it would be readable with a microscope, um, so some basic optical technology for it up to maybe a thousand years or longer. And what's its connection to this comet, Laura, or this spacecraft? Well, when they were putting together the Rosetta mission, I think that they were probably doing a bit of a glamour search on the internet, and they found other projects called Rosetta, and they found ours. And uh, I think they thought, well, it'd be kind of cool, kind of like the Voyager disk, if, if they could have, on the Rosetta mission, um, a disk that represented humanity as well in the form of our human languages. And so we arranged to have one of our disks actually on the Rosetta ESA mission craft. It's not on the landing craft, so it's not going to land on the comet. It's going to be in the, uh, it's actually on the craft that's going to orbit with a comet under some, um, some thermal blankets ah. to protect it. Ah. And so you've created this disk and you created this archive of human languages. Why, why create an archive of human languages? Uh, because it's a really good representation of humanity and the, the diversity of humanity, our cultures, our languages, um, and the way we think and interac interact with the world. So it's actually a pretty good representation of us as human beings on planet Earth. And also, every language that's on this disk um, represents a long period of development. Many of the languages that we have that are spoken today have been around for thousands of years and developing for thousands of years. So it's a very deep look at humanity and our history and our interactions with each other. Um, I think you brought us a little bit of a little movie that gives us a little bit of a closer look at the disc. Yeah, um, so this is going to show you what it looks like when you look at the Rosetta disc close up. And th now these are some pictures that we have of uh, pretty zoomed out. You can see on my disc there's little kind of points of little points of light on there, and each one of those is a page. There's over 15,000 pages on this disk, and each one is a page that we scanned originally from a book that was in that language or talked about that language, the structure of the language, the, the vocabulary words of the language, stories in that language, and we have this for over a thousand different languages. We also have the same kind of information for each language, and the reason for that is with like the original Rosetta Stone in, in that was discovered in Egypt that, that unlocked hieroglyphs. The idea is that this disk could help us unlock like a secret decoder ring, the information that we leave to the future written in our human language form. So it could provide a key to, find, to learning more information about human languages and cultures and, and our knowledge of, of the world. So Assuming that somebody out there can read it, right? Assuming that somebody out there can read it, but um, you know, the, the technology that we used to make this disk, you can actually fit a lot more information than we did. In fact, you can put so much information on there at such a density that you need an electron microscope to read it. Huh. Uh, but we kept it at the level that you could read it with an optical magnification, like a microscope. And most of you have seen microscopes in your schools. 
Um, this is just a slightly different, slightly more high-powered one, but it's technology that we've had around for hundreds of, hundreds of years. So if a culture of the future has the basic technology to look at the stars and maybe fix bad eyesight, if we still need to make glasses, then they should be able to create the technology that, they, that you would need to be able to read this disk. So it would be useful even here on the planet, That's not right. just out in not space. That's right, not just out there in space trailing a comet. Now you, you said this is part of the, a larger archive. What's in the archive? So the, we started the collection in order to make the disk. And as we started building it and building it, we actually got lots more information that actually fits on the disk. And also, what we have on the disk comes from books. So we scanned pages from books, and we put together a whole big image that we then kind of etched and put onto this disk. But since then, we've also collected lots of audio recordings of the world's languages, and we're starting to do video recordings, even from some projects and some activities here going on in the Bay Area. You brought some of those with you today, I right? I did. I did. I brought a selection that I thought would be interesting to talk about. Uh, so... <laughs> So what you're hearing right now is an, a recording that was made around 1940. It was made on an aluminum disc, kind of like a record machine, um, by um, somebody who was working with the Smithsonian. And it was made in um, a community, probably sitting in the home of the speaker. And it's, the recording is of a language that was spoken originally here in the Bay Area. All the Miwok languages and the Ohlone languages were spoken here in the Bay Area. And um, those languages have some speakers left, and um, we call them endangered languages because they have just a very few elderly speakers left. But many of them are in the process of being renewed and brought back to use in their community. And this is happening not just in, around here in California, but actually people are trying to do this all over the world because they're losing languages at a very rapid rate and people are trying to retain their, their use. Cool, and why don't you tell us about the second language before we hear the clip? Uh, so this second language um, is called Yiddish. And Yiddish developed in the 10th century in Central Europe uh, by a community of, of Jewish cultural people. And it has since spread, there's about 1.5 million speakers of this language. There's a lot of people who speak the language here in the United States, also in Israel, but around, around the world as well. And as a project uh, with Rosetta, we teamed up um, with a group of people who wanted to make recordings of the Yiddish language, and we did this in the East Bay, and it was called the Recordathon. And so we had about 30 people who spoke Yiddish, who came together and told each other stories and had conversations. And we, we videotaped them, but we videotaped them with our cameras, our cell phones, um, our computers, and people were just having a great time. So this is Itzhak Mo Moses, who's telling a story. It's actually a joke in Yiddish. And if anybody speaks German, you might recognize some familiarity with German, because actually Yiddish is a German language or Germanic oh, language, so doch, just yeah. like English is also a Germanic in language. In Fantastic. So, yeah, so the final thing you brought us today. So this third language is called, uh, that we're going to play a recording of, is called Tok Pisin. Um, and this is a language of Papua New Guinea, and that, that name actually comes from talking pigeon. And pigeon probably comes from the word business. And pigeons are, they develop, they develop where there are people who are coming together to interact with each other or maybe have business with each other. Um, and so they, they develop a very kind of bare-bones way of communicating with each other. 
Um, well, this happened in lots of places around the Pacific, uh, Pacific Islands and other places in the world, but Takapisan is a pidgin that's similar to other pidgins that are spoken in that region. But it's one of the official languages of Papua New Guinea, and there are many, um, with a pidgin, there are many, many people who speak it um, as a second language. Actually, a pidgin ha has all second language speakers, but what can happen is um, if children start hearing it as their first language as they're growing up, they develop in it into a Creole, which is like a full-fledged human language. And there are um, many people who speak this as a first language, um, and there are about 50,000 people who speak it as their only language. Um, and so it's the major, there are, Papua New Guinea is one of the most linguistically diverse places on earth. There's several hundred languages spoken by very small groups of people in Papua New Guinea, but they have this language in common. And so even if they don't speak somebody else's language, you can communicate to each other in, um, in this pidgin or in English um, as one of the official languages. Okay, well, let's have a listen to this. By booking on budget. I walk in big floor, get up on pot mosby, city blow pot mosby. Bamba equal long lay, equal on medang, go up long we walk map long West Indian borders, uh, long uh, Hollandia, one and a half Nikam. I should long say and this, long West this recording was made now in the United Nations. Uh, long and long the recording is part of a collection well. that was brought together yeah. by the ethnomusicologist yeah. Alan Lomax, yeah. who was actually yeah. studying yeah. human languages yeah. as well. Yeah. So long she long she pick me come long em, plus saxa, plus book book. That's how they got big black company. You find him copper, one by come up, and speak one by come up. Long have long you said one by come up. So this language is still evolving and changing right. and gaining so, speakers. So when a pigeon becomes a creole, it's like uh, a baby language. It's becoming a new language. Um, and there's several languages that are emerging this way around the world today. Well, that's amazing. So we had a very endangered language a language spoken all over the world, and a new and evolving language. That's right. And all of these are in your archive? Yes. Can anybody access this archive? Yes, our archive is an open collection, meaning that anybody can uh, go into, um, it's actually in the Internet Archive in a special collection, so anybody can go there and look at the things that we have on the Rosetta disk, or listen to our audio recordings, or see the video that we've made as part of Recordathons. That's fantastic. And so for more information, People can also just go to uh, www.longnow.org slash Rosetta or rosetta.org. And we also have some links there. We've, of course, been following the Rosetta mission for about a decade now. <laughs> so we have some links there. So you can uh, keep tabs on Rosetta by keeping tabs on us. All right. Well, thank you so much, thank Dr. You, Welcher. That was great. And thank you for joining us. Um, Everybody cross your fingers that the Rosetta spacecraft will wake up on Monday. And thanks for joining us here at the Exploratorium. <laughs> All right. I think we did it. Thanks, everybody, for, for joining us.